People seem to forget, if you change today, today will change your life. Hello, Andrew. How are you doing? I am fine. Thank you, David. Good Excellent. stuff. Good stuff. Well, I'm very happy to have you here. And uh, we've just been speaking for a few, few minutes off air, but it's a, it's, it's a pleasure to have you. So just for the people listening in, uh, tell us a little bit more about yourself, An- uh, Andrew, so we've got a bit of uh, context and people can get to know who you are. Right. Um, my name's Andrew. And uh, in fact, this year, I managed to hand cycle from Land's End to John O'Groats. And I think that's my biggest kind of sporting achievement uh, to date, I would say. But I haven't finished with my uh, challenges, but uh, that's my main thing, I suppose, that I've done in the, in the last year. I mean, so that, it's, an, it's an incredible achievement, one to, to be able to hand cycle it as well. But so my, my dad, having done hands into John O'Groats, um, what's the distance like for, for that? I, I forget what the number is in terms of how far that actually is. Well, it varies depending on what route you take. But right. um, we, <laughs> we, we went on some of the back lanes to avoid all the kind of the major trunk roads. Um, right. And it ended up 992 miles. Oh, my God. And we did that in 13 days. 13. So, wow. yeah, it, it wasn't too... In fact, I thought that it was going to be quite a stretch. But um, it ended up not being too bad, actually. The... the um, it averaged out at about 80 miles a day, I suppose. And yeah. when you kind of cut that down into chunks, like 25 miles and a rest, then another 25, it kind of breaks the day up. Therefore, mentally, it's not that difficult. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, that is a, 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 you say it's not that difficult, but I think for the average person listening in, they're now thinking, oh my God, I'm really not up to scratch if it's, <laughs> if it's not that difficult. But I know what you mean. So, Talk, talk a bit about what that preparation actually looks like for you. Well, the preparation, um, uh, quite a bit of training involved. Uh, but the, the point was, is that, which surprised quite a few people, I suppose, um, the first day, well, I think we had to do about 65, 70 miles on the first day. And I'd only ever hand cycled a maximum of about 55 miles in a day. Right. And that was uh, all my training. I never did any more than that. And um, the person who helped me run this, Emma, she was absolutely amazed that uh, when I told... I didn't tell her beforehand that, because I don't think she'd have taken up uh, the, the challenge with me. <laughs> okay. But um, <laughs> I, I told her after the first day, um, uh, which was a very much of a surprise to her. But I said, that's the way that I've trained, really. I haven't mm-hmm. actually done the distances. Uh, but I did a lot of kind of back-to-back day training rides. Um, but the whole point is, is that you've got to fit in your life as well around training. Therefore, it isn't like you're just riding the bike for a day. You've also got to go and walk the dog. You've got to do your work, then walk the dog again, then put your training ride in in between. Therefore, all that amounts of burning quite a lot of energy during the day. Whereas... When you're doing the Land's End to John and Groat's ride, all that you're doing, basically, is riding a bike. Mm. So all your energy is put into that. Yeah, and uh, I mean, from an energy point of view, yeah, when you've got that sort of freedom or spare time to actually commit to it, as you say, to be able to work around your schedule. I mean, there are so many people in life who, whether it's they might regard it as work-life balance or whatever it might be, to find that level of energy and and but just i guess commitment and motivation to actually find the time because i i speak to enough people who they say oh i don't have the time to do this and i don't have the time to do that and yeah i really want to do this but i just don't have enough time and you ask them well what did you do on saturday and they're oh i, I you know i binge watched game of thrones or whatever and they just they <laughs> haven't got that level of commitment and motivation and drive which clearly you do so andrew where does that drive come from in you um, I suppose it's uh, through my life experiences, I suppose, um, because I've always been kind of driven to do things. You know, I've never been one really to sit down and just kind of uh, laze around. Uh, my father was always extremely energetic. And I think a lot of it does stem from your parents. If your parents are energetic and always on the go, mm. I think you actually learn a lot from them and you kind of as a child you don't really think about it too much because you're just so free but you do imitate what your parents do 
And if they're always up and about and doing things, I think you just follow suit. And I think it's, it, it doesn't matter what abilities you have or what limitations you are, you still get up and try different things. Um, and that's what I've done all through, through my life, I suppose, um, is that I've always kind of got up and tried things. I've never, I've never found, you know, I've always been curious about kind of activities, I suppose. And if you don't give something a go, you'll never know whether you're good at it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I used to be, well, <laughs> my parents probably still would say I am, um, you look, come across a fussy eater who won't try something where they, they don't know if they're going to like it or not. They've never tried it before, but they actually just make the decision that they don't want to have it. You know, try that. And something as simple as yeah. that, if you're not willing to, to try something, even something to eat or sort of a piece of food, what are, the, what are the thousand other things that we're not also willing to try where if we actually put ourselves out there to do such a thing? Um, actually, well, that's very true. And, and, and also, you, you've got to preach, I think I'm slightly older than you, uh, I'm 57. Therefore, when I grew up, you know, we didn't have social media or mobile phones or anything like that. There was only like three or four, well, three stations on the TV. And the TV only came on like at six o'clock at night, you know, and went off at like, uh, you know, 11, 12 o'clock. You had the um, test card, didn't you? Kind of displayed. Mm -hmm. um, there wasn't daytime TV. Therefore, there weren't as many distractions as there are now, I suppose. Therefore, you had to go outside and make your own kind of um, uh, interest, you know, kind of activities, you know, that sort of thing, really. So, yeah. And, and, you, and, and also, you got involved with sport more because that, that was the way you kind of hmm. um, engaged with people. Hmm. I mean, what, what's your... I mean, I've got a, a sort of a fairly um, rich background in terms of sport. So what, what, what's your sporting background like? Um, I... I've always had a very good eye for the ball. Therefore, I played a lot of table tennis. My father was a lot into tennis. Therefore, I started off on a tennis court with my father. Um, and also, mother was into swimming. Uh, therefore, um, every uh, day after school, I used to swim. Um, and that would be, you know, kind of like a mile after, you know, kind of every day, basically. Um, which we had, a, we had a full length outdoor pool where I grew up. Um, therefore that, that was a great pleasure um, so yes so it was that, that that was my kind of background really from, from a sporting side mm -hmm. with the ball sports and, and a lot of swimming I mean I, w I want to ask you what sport teaches you what I want to talk a bit a little bit about as well is is some, a bit more about what, what the people actually listening wouldn't know about you as well um, and actually some of the things that other people might regard as limitations. And I know certainly from your point of view, you don't, but, but to talk about that in a, in a second as well, but from a sporting background, I mean, what, what do you think sport has taught you? I mean, when you have that, find that drive and commitment and motivation where you have to push yourselves in a athletic environment, I know the many benefits of that, but, but t tell me what else sport gave you. Confidence. Mm -hmm. I would say, you know, because you, 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 you are, you're normally doing it with other people. You, you kind of, there is quite kind of a, a unique bond that you have with other people when you're kind of doing, you know, you've got that same interest and you're swimming together or you're playing tennis together or, you know, anything like that really. Uh, um, and also it does give you a bit of a drive. It doesn't matter when people say, oh, I'm not competitive. Oh, I'm not competitive. You know, that's a, um, to me, that's a load of rubbish, really, because you know, <laughs> when you start doing something, you are competitive. It doesn't matter what your brain is telling you. Yeah. You, are, you want to do the best that you can. You may not win, but that doesn't mean you're not competitive. You know, so that, that's another thing. It means that, that, you can, that, that, you, that you don't mind striving for something, you know, and um, if you, if you realise that if you, if you just go that extra mile, I know that's a cliche, but an extra mile, then you can always achieve something a bit more. You know, yeah. you put the time into it again, and you'll always achieve. You know, so um, and also, you know, the health benefits as well. You know, um, uh, motivate you as well, I suppose. Mm -hmm. You know, to keep yourself as fit as possible. Yeah. So um, 
yeah, so that's what I've got out of sport, I suppose. I and, and I, I very much understand the uh, you mentioned competitiveness. And my mum got very good at ducking. I, I must have thrown many a table tennis bat at her head after her beating <laughs> me when I was younger. I mean, obviously, I stopped. You know, maybe at the age of maybe the ripe age of fourteen, which is maybe a bit too old. But um, but yes, they're very very competitive as on the sports side. But it does it does give you a hell of a lot, and um, it also gives you just you know, sport for me was very much a, a respite at, at different points in my life from actually maybe either how you felt for, from yourself, about yourself or a respite from things that were going on or whatever. But it was also, um, it was also your identity in many ways. It was part of who, very much part of who you are. And you realized that you, you had these sort of either capabilities or this uh, capacity to, to, because you have good coordination or you're athletic or whatever but also you you kind of reap the benefits from a very much a health point of view and it's uh when you find that i guess bug for for health and fitness you you start to as you get older really um feel the the amazing benefits of of having mm-hmm. lived your life that way um i mentioned because, because golf. i play golf now as well and yeah. um golf i find kind of teaches you patience you know because you cannot play golf if you're frustrated or if you're really stressed yes, out. You know, yes. You've got to relax when you're playing golf. Yeah. Um, you cannot think, oh, right, I'm going to thrash that ball. It won't go anywhere. You know, you've got to control yourself. Therefore, golf is a very, you know, people you know, say it's a good walk spo- spoiled, but it, it, <laughs> does, it does teach you teach yourself mental patience i suppose you know yeah. and you've just got to calm yourself down therefore it's a good way to unwind if you've had a really busy week sometimes mm. but from a, you know from a mental point of view is to get out on the golf course you know if you've got fresh air you've got to relax also you've got to kind of um interact with other people on a social level you know which also helps mm. as well yeah Absolutely. And uh, I mean, I'm, I'm good at most sports. Golf, I'm absolutely shocking at. Absolutely terrible. And just, but I use the analogy that, you know, with golf, it's just, it is frustrating because really you, you, when you strike that ball, you can be one degree off the, you know, where you, the middle of the ball and it goes 300 feet, 300 feet Correct. left or right. And I think that's true of a lot of, with most things in life, to be honest, where people feel like, oh, sometimes they're miles off. And actually, sometimes it's just, they just need to correct something by one degree and they'll be right back in the middle. They'll really be, be able to metaphorically strike through the, the middle of the ball, whatever it is that they're trying to do in their life. Sometimes we're only a degree off and it makes us feel like we're far away, but actually it's a very tiny adjustment we need to make. Um, but uh, no, it's, it's good to, to hear that, uh, that you've got... Um, I guess the patience for golf as well. I, I don't think I've got the patience for it, having, having done a few rounds in my life. But um, you're right. I think the, um, the, the kind, of, kind of the mental freedom aspect of it, as well as of sport, is, a, is, is very important as well. None more true than, than golf. And mm. as I said, I, 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 I wanted to talk a little bit about sport. Sport was a huge part of my identity growing up. And I was, a, I was a very much a footballer, and that was a sort of... Uh, a career which had started but then got cut short um and actually with that but with some other difficult things in my life how they can start to define you in certain ways or at least define you in the eyes of other people and what i wanted to talk only a little bit about um and as you as you were kind enough to to say um we could touch on the subject is uh that you're a a child of thalidomide correct and so not that we need to go in much detail, but what I was curious of having um, come across people, you know, you go come across people all, all walks of life um, who define themselves in different ways, but then there's also how other people look at them and define them as well. Um, and there's, there's a balance between the two things. And, and so what I was a little bit curious to ask about was from your perspective, I know that's, you know, very much not who you are and and also that whatever anyone i've ever spoken to the difficult moments that they have in their life difficult experiences or whatever is that they don't define that person either we all go through some some tough moments and tough things and 
we, we do our best to not let that be who we are. That's just something that happened or something that occurred. Um, I was curious to ask you, from that point of view, you, building your own identity going forward, I mean, how, how was that for you when with other people who maybe wanted to talk to you about thalidomide or people that were curious about it or whatever up, growing up, were you able to separate very much from, you know, people being curious about thalidomide, but also say, well, that's, that's not who I am. That's just something that happened. And, and how easy was that for you growing up? Oh, very easy, really, because pe- people, to be honest with you, didn't really understand what thalidomide was. Okay. You know, um, even today, I think today, I think it, not many, well, I say not many people, but it isn't readily recognised, is it? You know, you can talk to people and you say, um, you know, if you, you define yourself as a thalidomide, so to speak, that they'll say, well, what's that? You know, mm. um, but just for those people or in your podcast who may not be aware, it was a drug that um, a pregnant mother stuck in the late 50s and 60s. And unfortunately, one of the side effects was that um, your bones uh, were deformed as part of your fetus. Um, so uh, it's, I was just born like it. And it's just, you know, you've got, you've got two options in life, haven't you? To get on with it yeah. or to moan about it. Yeah. You know, and I just got on with it. And, you know, obviously, you know, when you're growing up as a child, you know, other children will ask questions, but they're just innocent, you know, and you're innocent as well. Therefore, you know, they'll just kind of say, oh, look, look at your hands. Why are they shaped like that? You know, and you just come up with a joke or something like that. You know, you may be, you know, you might say, oh, be naughty. Therefore, you know, that someone bent in the hand or something like that. You know, but, you know, you just kind of laugh it off, I suppose. And when sure. they realise that you can do exactly what they're doing, you know, um, they kind of accept you. Therefore, you know, I went to a normal school, a normal primary school, I went to a grammar school, you know, and I went to university. And at no point did anyone kind of uh, kind of put any barriers in the way or kind of keep asking questions as to, you know, why do you look like you do? You know, um, and again, for your podcast, just to give a bit of an explanation, um, mm-hmm. I've only got one uh, leg. Uh, my right leg is a full length artificial leg and I've got two shortish arms with no elbows and my hands are kind of what they say crooked they are right at right angles and I can't and I can hardly bend my fingers so but but, but that's me you know I just you know I don't think about it I never do you that's know, just I, what you know it's just what I know um you know it's far harder if a person's been in an accident say and had a spinal injury and then they're paralysed, you know, because they knew what it was like before right, yeah. uh, that they were paralysed. You know, therefore, that they've got to have great mental strength to overcome that and start a new life. Whereas for myself, it's just something like, you know, mm-hmm. I, I don't know anything else. Therefore, you just kind of get on with it, I suppose. Yeah. So, so how it was perceived by the people, I can't really answer that. But, you know, I think in any kind of society if you kind of try to mix, and that's why sport was a very good kind of level up really, because you weren't sidelined. You kind of mixed mm. in with the lads and the girls, you know, uh, with whatever sport you played and, and you kind of, you were then immediately accepted. Yeah. Does that makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No. Uh, and uh, yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. Sport is a very good leveler where it's um it, it certainly brings people together and so and in those days there was no para sport as such you know that there were you know whereas now there's a lot of you know kind of para sport you know there there are clubs you know to 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 help people with limitations etc and to encourage them to get get in mm. whereas when i was growing up in the 60s and 70s you know if you didn't kind of play the normal games so to speak there was no alternative for such hmm. yeah no it's uh, yeah sport has made a, a real uh, effort but even in the last 10 years but 20 years um it's uh, it's, it's it certainly has expanded in, in a lot yes. of ways to be a lot more inclusive absolutely and so 
the thing I was really curious of asking about um, knowing that stuff, but also knowing that the, the, the huge challenge of um, lands into John O'Groats and but also the other many challenges that you've taken up in, in some ways. And one of the things I, I noticed you'd, you'd had on your, uh, on your Twitter page or in the bio was you put, um, in fact, I can't even read my own writing now. What have I put here? <laughs> um, you know, you, you basically put we we can't we can't control or we can't sort of control um we can't do it their way is what you put you we can't do things no no, no. no. Well, what i said if you can't do it their way you can do it your way yeah yeah um, and, and i liked that and it's it's a real it's a very um sort of biological natural instinct to compare because it's a survival trait for us to compare um, you know ourselves to other people because at the beginning of time you needed a, a community or tribe around you um, or to be top of the you know top of the herd in order to survive obviously that's not the case anymore but we still have that instinct to to be compa- you know to compare and see what other people are doing and we can't often help that but it is a good re- I just thought it was a very good reminder of actually just because you know there's stuff around the science of achievement where you know, if you look at something someone else has done and you model that, then you, you've got a good chance of actually finding a, a route to success. Success leads clues. But at the same time, we might not be able to do things the same way. We might not have the same resources or the same talents or the same skills or whatever. And that it's actually okay that the, the way we go about things and to be, be accepting of the way that we're willing to go about things is good. And it's, and it's the right thing to do because if we do it through our I guess our own filter rather than try and do it through what someone else's filter might have been, then you're more likely to have success in that way. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about that, a little bit to that. Well, all I was trying to get at was um, when I kind of said that was just through life, really, you know, I started off, you know, I used to um, have a three wheeler uh, bike when I was young and I used to go all over the place with that. Now, uh, it, again, in those days, that was a virtually unheard of a one legged cyclist, I suppose. But my father had geared it up, therefore, it was just had a fixed pedal and, uh, and there was no right pedal to it. And there was a stanchion for my artificial leg. And you know, when the pedal was at the bottom, you just kind of rocked the bike to one side and kind of and got the pedal to the top if you were, st- you know, a station or something like that. Um, th- therefore, again, you know. It was, ad- you know, it was adapted, you know, I did it my way instead of the normal way, so to speak. Um, and if I hadn't got that adapted, then I wouldn't have been able to cycle. And again, it's going, th- going through life, I suppose. And if you relate it to sport, um, I played quite a lot of squash um, at quite a competitive level. And again, people think, how on earth can you get around a squash court, you know, to, to a certain level on one leg? Mm. Um, but again, um, uh, the um, I played in the Shropshire League, and uh, the Shropshire League were very fortunate in the sense that they they allowed me to play to slightly different rules, which I don't know if you ever played squash, but the courts divided yes. into yeah. uh, quarters and a half, and they allowed me just to kind of uh, play in one half. Therefore, the opponent always had to get the ball back into my kind of half, and that was accepted by all the teams and. You know, um, which was great. Again, it, it's it's allowing you to play sport your way, but not necessarily the correct way. Um, and then when you bring it up to modern day, i.e., my my hand cycling, which I'm into now, mm-hmm. you know, I've adapted a normal hand bike to my way. It's slightly different to others, but it has to be because I've got no elbows. You know, I've got very short arms. Therefore, it's all adapted. Um, but it means I can get out and do things. You know, so it's just basically, you know, there aren't any limitations, really. The limitations shouldn't be a barrier. You know, you should just, there's, there's normally a way around something if you've got the drive and you want to do it. Mm-hmm. Does that help? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And and you mentioned, you, you mentioned the word adaptability a few times there. And, yes. you know, I, th- I think in life, a lot of people they have an idea of how things should go or how to tackle a challenge or how to overcome this or conquer this or whatever. 
and they they find that when the approach that they thought up or when they first had the idea or whatever when they realized that the approach that they were going to take or the the process they thought was required isn't right they become easily disheartened or or easily frustrated and so what i want to ask you was based on the amount of times you mentioned adaptability there is I, 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 a lot of the people I work with, I, I tell them that when we think back to a memory, when we think back to an event in our life, we're not looking back at the event itself. We're looking back at how we saw the event at the time, how we perceived it. Um, and that's the memory. And therefore, how we perceive a moment at any time, you know, if we perceive it in a negative or a positive way, that's going to impact how we remember it in the future. So actually how we perceive, how we interpret something there and then in the, in the first place is incredibly important to actually keeping up momentum in our life. And so the, the, the capacity or the ability for people to stay positive when something doesn't go the way that they thought it was going to go and that they can keep that positive mindset so they can be adaptable, so they can be flexible, so that they don't lose momentum and they can try something else is really really important and so i wanted to ask about when, when it comes to keeping a positive mindset when we've got to you, you know you've got to be adaptable to make something work how do you how do you keep yourself positive how do you think other people can keep themselves more positive when they are initially disheartened or frustrated that they can't do things one way but they need to stay positive so that they can learn how to do it a different way that's a very good question i don't know how i keep myself positive you know, uh, I, it's just that um, I, I really don't know, David, um, in the sense that um, I, I always think there's always a solution. Therefore, if you always believe there's a solution to something, mm. then it just means sitting down, contemplating it, and trying to find a way around that issue that you're trying to work out. Um Therefore, it might not come to you straight away, but you know there's 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 normally a way around something. You know, if you if you want it that badly, um, you will you will find a solution. Um, mm -hmm. But I've never really thought how do you keep yourself positive. You know, it, it's it's just me, I suppose. Um, people say I'm well. Some people say I'm extremely stubborn. Um, <laughs> if I don't kind of give in to things. You know, that's a helpful, um, helpful trait, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, um, you know, I've always looked after myself as well. I, I, I live by myself. I always have done. Um, you know, I live with my dogs. My dogs are a great company for me, and uh, um, therefore I just kind of get on with things. I suppose. Mm. You know, I, I don't. I don't. I'm not a deep thinker. I, I you know, I really am not. I just kind of. Um, and also, you've got to be happy with whatever you're doing. You know, mm -hmm. if you're happy doing something, then you'll always do it to the best of your ability. You know, I always, if you're not happy in something, don't do it. You know, yeah. why, why put yourself through, through something that isn't making you feel kind of valued and happy, really? You know, I was very, very fortunate in the sense that um, when I was working full time, um, I really enjoyed the work I was doing. Therefore, at no stage in my working life did I find or feel that, oh, I shouldn't be doing this. Um, I, I looked forward each day to going into work, you know, um, and I kind of was, again, I tried to uh, be very enthusiastic with the team that was working around us to try and make it a fun place to work, really. Mm -hmm. um, because I always find that if you're having a, you can still do your work if you're having a bit of fun. You know, mm -hmm. people who are who are kind of negative and don't kind of uh, have a kind of a happy outlook, then sometimes they struggle, especially in life and with work, really. So, you know, that's that's how I've just treated everything I kind of face, I suppose. Mm. And you you touched on something that I'm. Oh, so I'm a, I am a. Well, I have had in the past the tendency to overthink and be a deep thinker. Mm. Like anything, it's a, it's a gift and a curse, I guess. Certain behaviours that they help you in this way and they don't help you in this way. And 
you know, same with parenting, you know, if you get parented one way, it helps you with this, but it doesn't help you so much with this. And if you get parented another way, it helps you with this, but less with this. And so, you know, it's, everything is a, a sort of a gift and a curse in some ways. Uh, I think what you touched on there though, is, is actually, is, is very important where you say, I, I don't really think about it or that you don't think about it too much. And sometimes people have the temptation that if they spend more time thinking that it's going to help the situation when actually a lot of the time is, you know, the only thing that complicates things in life is humans or are humans. Um, and it's the, the way we go about it and the way we think about things. And actually when we well, learn it's quite detrimental, can't it? Yes, absolutely. And when we learn to step out our own way, things then things strangely too tend to be uh, a little bit better in that way. And so <clears throat> In terms of challenges going forward for you, Andrew, what other challenges are you looking forward to, to trying to, to take on? <laughs> right. Um, uh, I've got a challenge coming up this year. Um, I'm taking on another hand cycling challenge in May. Uh -huh. I haven't actually launched it yet. So it all depends when this podcast goes out to when, when people right, get, sure. get to know. Um, because at the moment, I'm, I'm in the process of trying to um, uh, get sponsorship for it. Uh -huh. Therefore, it might be a good idea to actually mention it, might it? Um, yeah, please. Yeah, well, yeah, yes, yeah, take yes, the opportunity. It's, it's part of a greater reach. You don't know who, who might be listening to this podcast. Though. Absolutely. Um, what, I'm going, what I'm trying to do, because I, I, I inadvertently admitted on live TV uh, when they kindly had me on Good Morning Britain for the second time uh, because I was on, on it prior to my challenge and then they, they asked me back afterwards and Ben Shepherd said had I found my limitation because that's what I went on in the mm. first place and said I hadn't found my limitations in life and unfortunately I replied no I hadn't found my limitations to it lands into done groups <laughs> and okay. And also it whetted my appetite to try and uh, do another challenge uh -huh. um, to see whether I can find that limitation, so to speak, really put myself physically and mentally through a real tough challenge and to see whether I can actually yeah. come out at the end of it. So I've decided uh, whether this is good or not. Um, I've decided to attempt to become the first ever hand cyclist to uh, cycle around Ireland. Okay. There is a designated route called Race Around Ireland, and it's a race that happens in August time. But I'm not entering the route. I I'm not entering the race. Sorry. Um, I'm going to attempt the actual route itself. Um, and uh, yeah, no other hand cyclist has ever done it. And it's 1,300 miles, and I aim to do it in 12 days. Okay. Wow, cool, okay. So that's over <laughs> 100 miles a day. It, and, the, and the thing is, you, you've you got to throw in the Irish weather. Yes. Into that, and also it, the Irish roads, and also the terrain. Hmm. So, yeah, I've upped the challenge. That well, that yes, up up to it you certainly have, and um, yeah, look, I'll, I'll invite you to absolutely, um, Andrew. That you, so, this podcast, this is just for people listening. So this is February twenty nine, uh, twenty nineteen, February twenty twenty, and so look, if they do want to sponsor you, Andrew, where where can they go to do that? Well, the the actual sponsor, um, or where will they be able to to do that? Right. In the that, that most probably I'll be, I'll be setting up a Just Giving page under Tim Paddison okay. again, like I did last year. Yep. But when I meant sponsorship, I meant kind of, I'm in the process of trying to get firms to Absolutely, yeah. sponsor yeah, you yeah, yeah. to actually yeah. fund the actual yeah. um, uh, um, uh, challenge. It will mm -hmm. still go ahead, but it's so much better if you can get firms, firms to actually yeah. help, help the funding. Because it isn't cheap. These challenges aren't cheap. Yeah. And last year, we were extremely fortunate well, I was extremely fortunate that a local firm, um, well, two local firms actually, uh, funded the actual challenge. So that helped no end uh, with the expenses. Mm -hmm. um, so this year at the moment, I'm still kind of, um, I'm sending out a lot of emails, 
knocking on a lot of doors, yeah. uh, trying to um, um, persuade businesses that um, they will get some, well, quite good media kind of uh, traction out of um, the event. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, and also it's to raise money again for charity because last year we managed to raise just under 28,000 wow. for, for cancer charities. Wow. So uh, this year, obviously I'd like again to uh, raise money for charity uh, because I always think it's important. Yeah. You know, for me in itself, the challenges for myself, but if you can give something as well back to society while you're doing it, then I think that that's really helpful. I, I totally agree. And I, I think it, this will feed into the next question I was going to ask really, but that people always want to sort of maximize their potential. They want to see how far they can go. And I often say to people that look, we're always willing, we'll always do more for other people than we'll do for ourselves in a lot of ways. And so to maximize your potential, one way to do, to really do that is actually, well, how are you contributing? How are you giving what you have, your skills, abilities, talents, time, whatever it might be, to a greater cause or to other people. So I totally agree with you in the in what you're saying about uh, charity. Then is, you know, yes, we want to absolutely support um, causes. We want to really be able to help make a difference. But also it, for people listening in, it's actually the opportunity to see well, actually, how far will I push myself when it's for something else, when it's not just for me. And people do find they actually go a little bit further at that point. And it, that, that sort of feeds into the next question, which was based on something you said, um, you were kind of asked when uh, you spoke to Ben Shepherd. The question is, do you want to find your limit? I think everyone should find their limit in some form, shouldn't they? And um, it would be, that's why I'm doing it, I suppose, to see where my limit is, mm. you know, um, I, I, because I, I think you can go beyond it, you know, um, but I think you've got to find it first off, haven't you? And um, so, uh, hence the reason why I've upped the challenge, mm. really. And, 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 and to actually, um, from, a, from my perspective, I do think it is going to be quite a tough challenge. Therefore, I've decided also this year that I'm going to video the whole challenge, um, which I didn't do last year. I just took photographs and people just along the way took a few kind of off their phone, you know, some mm-hmm. videos off the phone. But um, I'm going to employ a videographer who's going to, um, so we can uh, film every day, basically, and put a, a webcast out every night, and they can see how I've done during the day. Yeah, it's brilliant. Um, and also, maybe then at the end, if we get some funding for it, is to put a, a documentary together, yeah. you know, to yeah. actually, um, so because uh, well, last year, what I did, I on, on the Team Patterson Facebook page, I... Uh, wrote a blog every night. Now that was quite tiring, you know, after you've done the <laughs> yeah, writing and then you've kind of got the relaxation. But every night I did actually do a blog and I missed one night because of the internet connection. Right. And the next day I had so many people on Facebook, are oh, you all right? You know, where's the blog? <laughs> you know, well, what happened to it? You know, <laughs> therefore I had to do the blog again before I went off cycling that day. So mm-hmm. people got to realize I was okay. Yeah. Uh, and they kind of, they, they kind of enjoyed reading the blog uh, because I kind of tried to do it in a very light hearted way. Mm-hmm. Um, but this year, I don't think I'll have time for the blog. Therefore, if I've got someone filming it, then they can condense it into say a two, three minute video of the day. And that will explain everything that's happened, you know, of any con- you know, significance during during that um day's writing yeah and you can it obviously gives you more focus as well to, to to crack on and and not have to worry about um how you're updating or how you uh, interpret it but no i think a videographer is a and also is, you've got a wider audience that you yes. don't really want to let down so you know from a from a psychological point of view uh you you, you most probably will drive yourself a bit further because mm. you realize that people might be watching yeah but it, and I, I've no doubt whatever your next challenge might be after that. Might have a half a dozen people viewing it every night, so to speak. You know? Yeah. So. Well, <laughs> it's, uh, it's um, you know, for the next challenge that's after that, you'll obviously no doubt have grown your 
uh, your audience, grown your your sort of raving fans or whatever it might be <laughs> um, that want to that want to be part of your journey with the next thing and the next thing, which is uh, is a, is a fantastic thing, but um, all, all very inspiring. And uh, what you said about yeah, you, you know, you want to find your limit. It's I guess you're right in the sense that you f- you find that limit and then you find it so that you can overcome it. And sometimes, I guess. Um, part of my French, but there's some people who will kind of bullshit themselves about where they actually are in a particular area of life. Um, and because they don't actually believe they're quite there or they, or they, they're not actually entirely sure what that looks like. And they kind of have a rough idea and they say, oh, I'm, a, I'm actually up at this level or whatever it might be. When you, when you're vague in that way, it actually just leads to it making it difficult to know well what's the next level because if we don't cre- if we don't really know where we are what level we're at then actually how do we know what the next level looks like and sometimes i just have to help people accept where they are when well, you've got to be honest to yourself exactly well, that, that's what i'm saying you've yeah. got to be honest to yourself and you've also which some people find great difficult you've got to be honest to everyone else you know yeah you know you 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 should not kind of gild the lily so to speak, you know, uh, I've got no time for people who gild the li- lily. Yeah. You know, just, just be honest and admit, you know, that that's what, what you're doing. You know, um, there's no point in gilding it because you'll be found out. The people who support you on your journey, uh, whether it's sponsors, whether it's um, family, whether it's friends, whether it's uh, people who support what you do, whatever it might be, um, who who sort of, I guess, maybe talking more the, actually to do with the businesses and sponsorships, um, the people you talk to, do you find them to be kind of genuine, authentic people who 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 care? Obviously, they need to do it from a business interest point of view, which is absolutely fine. But the people you come across on your journey, who are the most genuine, authentic people you've come across? The general and the general public, I suppose. You know, they're, they're very, very supportive uh, wherever you stop and wherever you go. Mm. You know, um, they're very, very supportive. And the businesses that last year helped were genuinely interested, um, mm. you know, in the challenge, you know. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's why they um, um, sponsored us, I suppose. Yeah. Um, so I, I rarely have negativity, you know. Um, you know, uh, people kind of generally, I find, are, are very kind of helpful and, and enthusiastic, mm. you know. So, no, I, I don't kind of... You know, if people are negative, I just ignore them. You know, there's, <laughs> I yeah. know that's the whole thing to say, but there's, but there's no. no well, it's it's yeah. one of the so, um, yeah. It's one of those things where. Um, you know that yes you have to we have to accept to be honest with how we feel where we are all of that stuff but there's also stuff where yes sometimes we have to uh, share or let things out or talk to people about how we feel and all of that stuff but it doesn't mean that we have to let everything in either and exactly what you said about negativity where there's some things where you can just if it doesn't have to not everything has to break the surface not everything has to frustrate you and you just kind of let it wash past you and there's often it often with people who I find crave certainty in life. Some people have a, a higher or lower threshold in terms of the amount of certainty that they need in their life. People that need a bit more certainty, which often means a little bit more control, I guess. Um, that Those people tend to possibly get a little bit more frustrated when obviously things don't quite go the way they want them to or, get a bit more agitated or when people don't deliver and do this and do that um, they find it a little bit more difficult for that to wash past because they want to it just creates more uncertainty sometimes and when people aren't either doing their job or whatever it might be and so uh, your outlook and attitude is is admirable because I think a lot of people don't have that attitude that everyone um, you can see people's positive sides all the time because that's not always what's presented and so i mean i think i can imagine there'll be people listening in asking sort of thinking well what surely andrew gets frustrated or gets you know um agitated by this or this annoys him or whatever so so what are the things i'll ask the question for everyone else what are the things that would uh would rile you up oh if chelsea lose <laughs> oh yeah that, that's that's very very frustrating <laughs> if, 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 
if um, yeah, th- that's one of my passions is Chelsea Football Club. Okay. Therefore, yeah, if, if they lose, that gets very frustrating. And um, yeah, and especially if they're kind of one nil up and five minutes to go, we always seem at the moment to kind of let that last minute go. Well, that's, that's a season, isn't it? Frustrating, you know. Yeah. So yeah, it's just. <laughs> So it's something like that, I suppose. No, um, no, uh, joking apart. Um, no, I, I, I try not let things get to me. I suppose you say how I've been. You, you know, I'm an oldish fellow, well, not oldish fellow, but I'm, I've been here for fifty-seven years, and I've seen everything. Therefore, you know, you can understand the younger people getting more frustrated over certain things, I expect, because they haven't got the life experience sure. behind them. You know, so, and also, I do sympathise tremendously with the young today because they've got so many things that are in their lives that were never in our lives. And what I'm t- talking about is, is social media, mm. you know, and the, the harmful effects that social media can have. It can have positive effects and you can reach out to people like this podcast most probably is, you know, but there, there is a lot of uh, trouble that social media can cause to people mm-hmm. and also to vulnerable people yeah. who, who, who are not strong yet in their own mindset, you know, and take offence and kind of are hurt by, by unsolicited comments from people, you know, trolls and all that sort of stuff, mm. you know, that never used to be, you know. So I try and put myself sometimes into their position and think, well, how on earth would have I coped, you know, mm. in, in today's society if you kind of had people who hide behind a mobile phone and send awful tweets or Facebook comments to you, you know. It's, 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 it's a different world. It really is, you know. Um, so it's, you know, so I've seen a lot. I've, I've, I've done a lot. Um, but I do appreciate that life today is totally different than what it was when I was growing up. And I think when you get older, I think you learn and I think you can accept far more. But mm-hmm. it's growing up and, you know, I think people do have a lot more insecurity because of mm. the social media side. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even from my point of view, it's uh, a lot of my business will come via social media and for for, yeah, for people listening in, I, I, I totally agree with what you said. And I, I got to a point of what a while back where you check so many stats and this and that with your business, which you have to do, of course. But when you when you find yourself checking that stuff daily, it really does impact you. It really does play with your mind. And now all I I realized I can still run my business. I only check all of that stuff twice a week. And the amount of difference that makes in terms of the freedom of your mind. But actually, what's quite sad is remembering what it was like before social media in some ways and remembering that it was just, it was just fine. It was good <laughs> before all of that social media stuff happened. The, the world kept spinning and, and everyone, people were still happy and all of that stuff. And I really, just to add on to what you were saying and actually use it as a, a, a suggestion piece of advice, that really have a think about how you're, you condense or filter the amount of time. Social media is a fantastic thing for lots of different reasons. Well, but... it is absolutely. It, 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 I've got no qualms about it. Yeah. I think it's got tremendous positive things. You know, you can do with social media, and it's brilliant. You know, and you can reach out to so many people. But you've just got to have that proviso. Absolutely. And that that realise that also it can be extremely harmful. You know, yeah. people, and especially to the young. It really can. And, and unfortunately, it can taint a lot of the youngsters today. Yes. You know, um, whereas we never had that previously. Yeah. Um, I, I toast, I'm, and I'm glad that social media wasn't really up and running when I was, was younger. I think I sort of, I kind of just missed the boat on that, I think. So, uh, you, and I'm absolutely right. It's, and I, I sort of form it a question. You mentioned about, you know, when people are a bit younger, they haven't yet built that kind of, I guess, strength of mind, I think is the phrase you use. Yes. And I totally agree. And the question I want to ask is, um, I'm sure it's possibly not something you've necessarily thought about before, but 
at what point do you think people do start to build that strength of mind? Do you think there's, a, there's an age or a period in life where people typically start to be a little bit more structured, a little bit more realistic, a little bit more, um, I'm trying to think of a better word, uh, a little bit more uh, sharp in the mind and a bit more resilient? Do you think there's an age and period or period? No, I, I really don't think so. And I think that is such a generic question. Everyone's an individual. Yeah. You know, um, people have totally different life experiences to one another. Mm. You know, we're all, we are all different in our way, you know in, in, you know, in our own way, which is wonderful about human beings. But then again, it can be very frustrating uh, for some people. Um, but you cannot... You cannot dictate to people when you yeah. say, oh, you're 30 now. You should know your own mind. That doesn't happen. You know, you, you can have a 70-year-old who does, still doesn't know their own mind, you know, mm -hmm. and where they are, and they may be insecure. You know, it, it's, you know, some people will never find it, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't psychoanalyze anything, I suppose. I just kind of get, get on with it. And mm -hmm. I think that's, if people start to psychoanalyze themselves, I think, they're, they're asking for trouble I think you know just 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 try and enjoy yourself if you enjoy yourself a lot of good will come to you yeah and that, I think that very much goes in line with um, people trying to make decisions about things I think a lot of people spend maybe 90% of the time trying to make a decision and 10% trying to make it the right one whereas really it should be about 10% making a decision and then 90% trying to make it the right one it's it's you're right in the sense that a bit of a bit too much um analysis or psychoanalysis or however however one might want to phrase that when actually if we just sort of have an idea and we attempt it and do it then actually you might you you'll learn much quicker um than actually just trying to think things through all the time and second guess and hesitate and all of that stuff but i, I totally agree at any age i guess no one ever feels like they've they've got things worked out do they so it's uh, it's one of those things where it's a, a never-ending process and your your mind sharpens with the experiences that you have as well so um i do tend to agree very much so on on that score um and as we sort of i guess come towards the end of this of this podcast andrew and and thank you very much for your your time it's very much appreciated um for the people listening and we've got people you've mentioned a few times to just learn to enjoy yourself um i think a lot of people whether it's in business or anything else they they, they sort of they kind of not they'll be nodding to that into going oh yeah i know that i know that but they'll know it intellectually but they don't actually do it in practice and so when you've gone about in your life to find the things that you enjoy doing, and you've obviously been clearly been a very, I guess, adventurous individual, or very curious to, to find out what your limits are and curious to find out what you enjoy and don't enjoy. And I just wanted to ask really in terms of a message for people listening, how that they might, how they might go about finding more and more things that they enjoy doing. It might be a, a very straightforward answer for yourself, for, you, for yourself, because you, the way you, you keep things very simple in terms of the approach and simplicity is, well, complexity is the, is kind of the, um, is the thing that uh, makes things more and more difficult and simplicity really helps people actually take action. What sort of message would you have for people to, if they're not, enjoying themselves if they're not finding fulfillment if they're not actually getting on with how their life is at the moment what what advice might you give them advice oh well, i'm not used to giving advice like that um i would never let approach i guess yeah i'll never lecture anyone on how they sure. should lead sure. their lives lives um it's entirely up to them because as i said previously everyone's got different kind of responsibilities you know they've got families they've got children you know that you know you, you you really don't know and they might be you know in a job that they have to do they might not be enjoying it but it's a job that they have to do to actually sure. make ends uh, uh pay i suppose um so i, I really don't know or all, all i can say is work is a big part of your life when you think about it the majority of people you know the old phrase work well, nine to five you know uh five days a week i know that doesn't happen as much these days sure. as, you know as it used to but you still spend the majority of your your life working therefore i think it's very important 
that you do find a job that you can get that you can get some enjoyment out of you know mm. um, because otherwise that is going to drag you down massively and i've been very lucky that i managed to find you know an enjoyable job i suppose um, over 30 years and um that that helps no end um and that's a good foundation really um and if you if, if you were just getting by then i would say then you should kind of uh, compensate that by by having enjoyable hobbies and really make the most of those hobbies therefore you've got something to look forward to after work mm. you know as well and and just do don't be forced into doing something that you're not enjoying you know you've got to enjoy it really and that's that's the way i've been through all my life you know i i i i, I i'm i'm kind of a happy-go-lucky chap really i always see the funny side you know i will i will take the mickey out of anyone and people can give it to me and i will take it you know um i don't mind that at all i prefer banter than being serious you know um and just kind of just enjoy yourself that's my message then enjoy yourself <laughs> good stuff so. well thank you very much andrew and just so for for people who uh uh, enjoy your enthusiasm I guess more than anything where they can they find you and where they can keep up to date with what you're doing is it team Patterson that most that, that's uh, you know most that's the Facebook page where um, I'll be launching again this year's challenge and also I'll be announcing on that page I suppose where the separate webcast uh, will be set up um, for the um, May irish challenge so yes that's the best place to kind of find me really yeah. excellent okay well i, I, I th well firstly I've, I've very much enjoyed the conversation and, and your uh, enthusiasm does very much radiate through i'm sure people listening will feel that as well so if, if you if you want to f continue that uh, continue feeling that sensation, but keep up with what Andrew is doing um, with some of the amazing challenges that he's done. Then, uh, as as you know, certainly uh, continue uh, following what Andrew's doing, as will I. And um, Andrew, I just want to finally say thank you very much for your time. Well, and, thank uh, you for having uh, me, David. You're welcome. That's very kind of you. Thank you. <laughs>